um, what do I say? Thank you so much, uh, Tristram and John, for the very, very kind things you, you said. I was very moved by them and very grateful for them. Um, don't know quite how I can follow it, really, but I'll try. Um, and also, thank you all for coming. Um, actually, looking at the sea of faces, it's as though the whole of my professional life is flashing. <laughs> you know, there you are, you know, and it's just fantastic. And I am ever so grateful to you for, for coming. Um, I'm going to mention a few people uh, as I go along, but not that many, and I'm conscious that actually there's a lot of other people who are here who I really should be mentioning, but then I won't say anything because I'll just be mentioning people. So if I don't mention you, please, um, I, I would have liked to have done, but I can't mention everybody. But there are so many people here who've made such a fantastic contribution uh, to the career development field in all sorts of ways, and people who, for whom it's been me, for me a privilege to work with and to get to know, and it's lovely to see so many old friends. Um, and the other thing that's rather special for me is that um, my long-suffering, lovely wife, Judy, is here. <laughs> and um, she's only been to one of my lectures before, about 30 years ago. <laughs> and it was obviously rubbish, because she's never been since. <laughs> but she did say she would come to this one, so that makes it very special for me. And also slightly nervous, actually. I'm really <laughs> a bit anxious about it. Anyway. OK, I mean, it's, it's a great honour to give this lecture. And I... Great on giving the first one, so to be given this one as well is, 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 is a great privilege. Um, because it is my last, uh, I promise you. Um, I, I decided about 18 months ago that I was going to retire, and I told enough people that now I'm going to be so embarrassed if I don't. So that was, the, that was how I've kind of done it. But actually, it's been rather good. I mean, I've, the last 18 months have been fantastic. I've done some really great work, very interesting work with all sorts of people, but I've also been kind of you know, reviewing stuff, trying to do some summative writing, ending projects, trying to hand things over to other people as much as I can. Um, and I've really loved doing that. So I think I, I feel very, very happy about it. Um, and uh, what I now want to do is give more time to, to other things. John's mentioned my interest in Handel. And um, I am actually running a class at the University of the Third Age in Cambridge on Handel Oxford and Oratorios in January. And indeed, any of you who wants an, a, not a lecture on Handel Operas, I will be loved to come, but not on career development. So that's, that's the deal. This is, on that, this, is, this is my last. What I want to do is to um, look back about on the last 50 years. I have been in 50 years. It's actually precisely 50 years. I'm a slightly tidy person, so 50 feels quite a good way to point to end. Um, and try to pull out some of the key lessons that I would draw from some of the work that I've been involved in. Um, I will include a few sharp comments on the damaging developments of the last few years, about which I feel very strongly. Um, I intend to follow Dylan Thomas's advice not to go gentle into that good night. But I will end on an optimistic note, because I believe there are really good grounds for optimism. So that's what I'm roughly going to try and do. Um, I came to this field in 1964, um, when Adrian Bridgewell and I set up Crack, which in those days was an innocent acronym. <laughs> it was the Careers Research and Advisory Centre. Um, I was 21. Uh, I had just graduated. I had, I, I had real problems about career decisions. You know, I was interested, I thought I'd stay on doing research. I was really interested in teaching. Um, I wanted to do something of social value. I was interested in publishing and journalism. And actually, in a way, I've done all of them, actually, threaded through the stuff I've done since. But I started to go and work. I thought I'd need to get out of education, basically. If I was going to do anything interesting, I had to learn what it was like to be outside education. So anyway, so I went to work for a publishing company called Core Market Press. Michael Herstein was one of the directors. And we, they published careers books. And Adrian, Bridgewater, who I had known at Cambridge, taught. And we felt, actually, partly because we felt, well, we'd had rubbish help. And we thought, actually, this is really quite important. It's actually quite interesting. And nobody's doing very much. And why don't we try and do something about it? And there's a limited amount you can do within a publishing company. So we just thought we'd set up an organization to do this. I mean, it was pretty naive. Um, but we did have a few ideas. And we learned as we went along. And it was an incredible you know, um, a privilege really, to be able to do it. Adrian had some business experience. I had some ideas about what we might do. So we started what would now be known as a sexual enterprise. That's what they're called now. That term wasn't used then, but we, it, that's how we set up non-profit making registered as a charity. 
And our aims were quite simple, really. They were twofold. One was to improve the quality of careers work in schools and beyond, and to act to develop closer links between the world of education and the world of work. Those are the two simple aims. And actually, those continue to be, I think, the core mission of my own career, as for many of you as well. I think that's what many of us in this room have been about. And I believe passionately in the importance of youth work. There are periodically siren voices that urge dropping the word career and finding a better one. But there's so many signs. This is a futile quest. Believe me, <laughs> there is no better word. Of course the word is problematic, and of course the old definition about progression up an order of hierarchy, the organizational progression, doesn't work anymore. It was in any case a middle-class elitist concept, all of that. But the word was always richly ambiguous. We also talked about careering about. And what we've got to do is to redefine it as about progression in learning and work throughout life. That's what I think it's about. And that's what we've got to assiduously foster and promote is that understanding of that definition of that word because it's an immensely powerful word. No other word does this, bringing together learning and work and being in the essence, as its essence about the individual. That's what it's about, and about progression. So learning, because it's not just education, it's training and informal learning. Work, because it's not just paid employment, it's also self-employment, unpaid work within households and communities, but at its essence about progression and development, lateral as well as vertical, and in principle, that concept is actually democratic and ac accessible to everyone. Limited for some, difficult for some, but in principle, accessible to everyone. And the core task of the career profession is to help to make it so. That's what all this work is about. And this matters deeply. Our careers significantly define how we spend a lot of our lives. The people we become and the contributions we make to the societies of which we are part. Our paid work represents a kind of social contract in a way <coughs> through which we agree to devote a substantial part of our time and energies to wider social purposes. That's why we get a salary or wage. Wider social purposes. In return for which we receive income, which we can then spend in whatever way we choose. If we can engage in forms of learning and work which utilize our distinctive abilities, interests, and values, we're likely to lead much more fulfilling lives, and we're likely to be more motivated and therefore more effective and more, make more effective contributions to the communities, the households, communities, and societies of which we are part. I mean, that seems to me to be so self evidently true. And yet, somehow, we don't get it right. We don't give enough focus on it. We find it difficult to do so. But that is what it's about, I think. And the philosophical roots of that perspective are deep and inspiring. As Ronald Sultana has recently reminded us in a, what I think is a brilliant essay, which I really commend to you, he, talks, he refers to Socrates, for whom every person has an arete or excellence, and it's by being the best that one can be through putting one's talents at the service of the community that one attains virtue. That's what Socrates said. And that was echoed by none other than Karl Marx, who stated that, this is a strict, direct quote, the chief guide which must direct us in the choice of a profession is the welfare of mankind and our own perfection. Isn't that extraordinary? Quite extraordinary words. That, is, that indicates how important all this is. And of course, it can never be perfect. Many people experience normal constraints on their lives related to inequalities of many kinds. But almost all can do more than they think they can do. And one of the tasks of career development support is to help them to realize that and to do so. And that's why there is a clear link between career development work and social mobility 
social equity and social justice. It is such important work. Where it's done well, it can transform people's lives. And yet, it's often, too often, derided. Usually by people who've made no effort to discover what it is or what it comprises. And the roots of that derision are complex. They may have had poor career guidance themselves, or they may want to take the full credit for their own successful careers, which, of course, good career guidance would have encouraged them to do. So I think that's one of the paradoxes which actually underpins some of the problem which we have. And, of course, while useful career conversations can be had with many people, the contributions of career professionals are, I think, <coughs> distinctive. Their role is not only to deliver services, but also to build the capacity of others. Without them, I am totally convinced, no serious improvement in career development support is possible. And over the last 50 years, we've made a lot of progress. When I entered this field, career services were very limited. Some schools had career teachers um, with um, a few periods a week, Bayfield usually, mainly to manage a small careers library, and some schools didn't even do that. We had a youth employment service which visited schools, largely to match early leavers to jobs, using a simple diagnostic device called the Seven Point Plan. Do you remember the Seven Point Plan, some of you? Yes, I see your, that's showing your age. Um, <laughs> and then universities had a, well, they had appointments boards, actually. They weren't called career services, they were called appointments boards, if you remember. And they focused mainly on job placement. And I remember as a student, you know, the notion was, if you want to get a job, you go to there. But if you didn't know what you wanted to do, there's no point going to there. So, you know, that was, that, was, that was what it was. And that was really largely it. There wasn't too much else, really. But in the 60s and 70s, all that began to be transformed. The twin concepts of careers education and counselling began to evolve based on a much more complex understanding of what was needed. The previous model had been actually a quasi-medical model concerned with diagnosis and prescription, possibly using psychometric tests or other devices, with the careers advisor doing the work. That was the model. Now the model shifted to learning with the active individual at the centre, complete change of perspective. And the focus began to shift from choosing a career at a particular point of time, usually around the transition from full-time education into the world of work. We talk about choosing a career, as though you then entered and did it. That was it, really. But we started to talk about, no, no, it isn't that. It's about constructing a career through the series of decisions we make throughout our lives. Very, very different way of looking at it. So that was a massive shift. And these careers education programs began to grow in schools and colleges and also in higher education. The youth employment service became the career service. Services for adults began to develop, initially through the occupational guidance units, later through a rich community-based tradition of educational guidance services for adults, alongside career development services within some large companies and other employers, and then a serious research tradition began to develop to support all that work with attention to theory as well as empirical studies. And we identified examples of good practice and sought to learn from them as a basis for spreading good ideas and encouraging innovation and development. So all that started to happen in that period in a really very, very significant way. And then we had to confront some major challenges, not least in the late 70s and early 80s, the massive, massive growth of unemployment, which was a huge challenge to this field, challenging many of our assumptions and practices. But I think we met that challenge very well through all sorts of very innovative things that took, that's happened around that time. And that brought this field into a position of much greater prominence and respect. We also had to address the challenges posed by the neoliberal policies pursued by the Thatcher and Major governments, 
which included things about the marketization of queer services, contracting out, experiments with guidance vouchers. And I was quite critical of those developments, partly on the theoretical grounds that the key role of queer guidance within that kind of ideological perspective is that of a market maker. It's a way of making markets work including the labour market and the learning market, well, if you want to see it in those terms. And it made little sense to marketise the market maker. So that was the argument. Anyway, we went to all those arguments, but the government went ahead, the Secret Service was uh, contracted out, but that process was really well managed by some excellent civil servants at that time. And I know because Barry Bayliss, who was one of the key civil servants at that time, invited me to come in and... and observe the contracting process and see what was happening. And it was done very, very professionally. And I think it was actually quite successful. It did result in quite a lot of innovation and energizing. Ministers have recently been stating uh, that there was no golden age in the vision of queer's work in this country. But I agree with Paul, Paul Chubb sitting down here, um, who's argued recently in a, a blog that we came pretty close to it in the mid-1990s. Incidentally, I want to pay tribute to Paul. Um, he has he has been, well, he's been in this for many years, been involved in so many initiatives, most recently as Careers England. I owe him a great deal because it was Careers England who commissioned me to do these policy commentaries, which have enabled me to, well, I've had to read all these government documents and, you know, every word that's been spoken in this field by any government minister I've read try to analyse, but it's largely due to Paul. His commitment has been fantastic, and I would like to pay a tribute to Paul. Um, but at that, I could agree with him. That it, was a, it was a good time. We had an Education Act, which mandated careers education in schools and the partnership between schools and career services. Uh, we had the CBI advocating the concept of careers for all. That was the slogan as the means of achieving a skills revolution. The CBI argued we need a skills revolution and there are four key building blocks and one of them is career development for all. Serious stuff. We then had the decision to establish a learning helpline for adults which subsequently became Learn Direct, which was a genuine world leader. And Gareth Dent, who's here, um, Guys, just stand up at the moment, because pick, please, just very briefly, just stand up. <laughs> this guy plays such an important role. He was a civil servant. He was very important in terms of um, the Guidance Council, which was also a great development at that time, which was jointly sponsored by the CBI and the RSA, bringing together all the key stakeholders and supported by the government to develop quality standards for the field. And Gareth, a civil servant, played a very important role in that, but then he left the civil service and helped set up Learn Direct, which was genuine world leader, and still no, no other country has yet done anything. Just think about it, within a couple of years, having set up this helpline, there were over a million calls a year to this helpline. I mean, I, I've quoted that so many times around the world, and people look, really? Over a million calls? And it was because it was done extremely professionally, and there was serious attention to marketing, which no other country has yet really emulated. So it was a, a, you know, it's still a beacon for us. Um, so it was, I mean, there were lots of things happening and lots of really good things happening. Not perfect, of course, there's still masses to do and we knew what those things were. And we then had a Labour Party paper on which I did a bit of work with others, with Steve Byers and Ruth G, which said we've got a lot more to do and what we need is for the career service to be an all-age service. And that was the paper and we had a paper it was going to be uh, published by the Labour Party and they were going to follow it through, but John Major called the election early. The paper wasn't published. David Blunkett, Secretary for Education, said early on, we're going to publish it and act upon it. They never did. And he said the whole thing got overtaken by connections. And this was where things started to fall apart. And I'm going to go through a little bit of this just that history, and it's a slightly sad history of what happened since after that. Uh, but I am going to go through it because I think it's actually quite important, and I think we need to acknowledge it and learn from it. So I'm just going to say a little bit about it. Um, so the connections was a good idea. 
bringing together all these services to address the needs of young people at risk. And that was the, the focus on young people at risk of dropping out. Really important social issue. And the basic analysis was right. We've got, to, we've got all these services dealing with this as their problem. We've got to bring them together. You know, we've got probation, social services, etc., etc. Bring them together and, and have a, somebody who has a, a relationship of trust with each young person is able to manage their relationship with these services. Absolutely spot on. But the only budget they could use was the career service budget, because all the rest of the budgets were local authority. But central government controlled the career service budget, and so that was used to create connections. And that's where things really started to fall apart, because it was supposed to be a career service for all young people, and then a holistic service for young people at risk. But all the performance measures were to do with the service for young people at risk. And performance measures drive performance. And the responsibility of running the service was given to Anne Weinstock, from a youth service background, who shamefully banned the use of the word careers. She said, we must not use this word. So careers, services, careers advisors were to be rebadged as personal advisors. The labour market knowledge was neglected. It was all about studying personal relationships. And there was significant professional erosion. And whereas previously almost all young people had seen at least once by a professional career advisor, that number went down and down. Now, towards the end of its time in power, the Labour government realised the error of its ways. And the reason was very simple. There was a report by Alan Milburn, which was on social mobility. And what he pointed out was in the virtuous attention to social exclusion, we had neglected the issue of social mobility. There were plenty of young people who were not going to drop out, but they were under aspiring. They had no, nobody to help them to raise their aspirations and to achieve those aspirations. So we'd neglected that issue. And that, that actually hit home. And towards the end of its time in power, um, the Labour government at the time made some acts of, I think they were repentance, actually. In particular, it set up a career suppression task force. And I did think that that was an act of repentance, but a good act, very, very good thing to do, to do, to establish, do something serious establishing, by, about establishing a stronger careers profession. Brilliantly chaired by Ruth Silver, excellent reports, accepted by the Labour government, and then also by the coalition government when it came to power in 2010. So we felt, actually, now we can start moving forward again. And the Conservative Party had committed itself in its manifesto to establishing an all-age care <coughs> service. And then John Hayes stood up in Belfast and gave this wonderful speech about all the things this government was going to do. We thought, yes, 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 all the things which we knew needed to be done there he was saying it, we're committing ourselves to doing this. Wasn't this fantastic? And what's actually happened is every single one of those promises has been broken. And that's what's so appalling about what's sub subsequently happened. The initial source of the problem, the initial block, was in a way not dissimilar to what happened in the Labour government, which was conflict with a major policy drive, which in this case was school autonomy. And it was a major drive. And, you know, there's a strong argument school autonomy. There's a lot of counter-arguments, but there is, you know, it's, it's, uh, there are strong arguments. Um, so setting up an all-day career service, how is that going to work in relation to school autonomy? So that started to kind of unpack and unstitch some of all this. So the duty to provide careers guidance was moved to schools to buy in services from the outside, which is not a partnership model, it's a contractor supplier model. Quite different. Quite different. And not necessarily with the new careers service, which was supposed to be building upon the best of connections and next step, but it could be with any provider. Um, and then we waited, awaited the announcement about the funding. 
because the assumption on the rest of the promise was we're going to build upon the best of connections and next steps. So obviously, all that funding is going to be there, isn't it? We assumed, and then we waited, and we waited, and we waited, and then we suddenly realised, actually, they're taking out the funding. But they're not announcing it, they're simply doing it, taking it out. All of it. Not some of it. All of it. And taking out the funding for aim higher, for education business partnerships, all stripped out. Now, we're a time of austerity, and one would expect some pruning, of course, like all public services, but to simply strip the whole lot out, all of that funding. And schools, so schools were now had the responsibility, they were supposed to buy in services but from their existing budgets with all the demands on those budgets. And they're not used to doing this. They're used to having a service provided. So this is a new cost. It's always, it's always, going, to, it's always going to struggle. So then we awaited the statutory guidance which schools needed to inform their budgets. And that's not, you know, we just, well, once we assumed again, well, that's about pretty quick, won't it? Because schools need this pretty quick. They've got to make these decisions. They need guidance on what they're supposed to be doing, what this act actually means for them. And we waited, and we waited, and drafts were circulated for consultation, and we gave comments, did we not, Paul? And we saw the draft getting better and better and better, and then they published it. And the version published was weaker than the first draft. Now, what was that? We'd always do all that effort. No, not even no attention to it, but actually going back pre-first draft. This is supposed to be, you know, democratic consultation. So, and in fact, what came out, basically what it meant is schools can do what they like. There was nothing here on which anybody could go to a governing body or a head teacher and say, you're not fulfilling your statutory duty. All they had to say was, well, we provide a reference to a websites and helplines. That's how kids do it nowadays. Don't you know? Kids are, you know, they're on Facebook. They're all on technology. They don't need all this other stuff. And if they genuinely believe that, which of course is crap, <laughs> but if they genuinely believed it, which some people do, game over. You know, we've met our statutory duty. Because that's what you know is what we think is appropriate for our kids. Now the Lib Dems were really unhappy about this. They'd been made promises, and they made starts to make a fuss. And so the government said, "Okay, we'll 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 do something. We'll have a supplementary practical guide. It won't be statutory, but it'll provide some steer for schools." So we waited for that. Months went past. It was eventually published wait for it, in the last week of the summer term, when the school's about to break up. Now, schools are supposed to make decisions about their plans for, but that's when they published it. I mean, this is, well, now, what is it? Is it total incompetence and or malign indifference? I think it's probably a mix of the two. So different from the Conservative government of the 90s, actually, which had ideas about reforms, but actually at least did it well. At least did it properly, competently, seriously. All that contracting out. What's been appalling about this government has been this mix of ill thought through ideas and utterly incompetent implementation. Now, there is a select committee on education, which is cross-party, and it's chaired by a Tory. Graham Stewart. And it was deeply concerned about what was happening. So it launched an inquiry and it produced an excellent, well evidenced and well argued report. And Tristram had a big role in relation to it. It was a really excellent report in all respects. And it basically said we've got to do we've got to do a lot more. It said we can't go, probably can't go back to the parts model we'd like to, but actually the government aren't going to do that. So let's be realistic, but we need to seriously strengthen statutory guidance. We need to give this new National Career Service a clear role in relation to schools, probably capacity building rather than service delivery, but it's got to be serious. 
So we made a whole series of recommendations, almost all of which were either ignored or rejected by the government. And shamefully, I'm afraid to say, they were also ignored by the National Careers Council, which is the body set up by John Hayes before he left his post to advise the government uh, on careers matters. I was a member of that body, and I and Heather Jackson, who's also here, resigned prior to its first report. We did so because of the way in which the process of the council were manipulated in the final stages to produce a report for ministers that failed to address all of these key issues, all the issues identified by the select committee, and which effectively, in our view, colluded with what we viewed as unacceptable government policies. I could not have done it without Heather. We did it all together. We did it with enormous care, agonised, and I still agonise, but I am absolutely clear we could not have done other. I am absolutely clear it was the right thing <coughs> to do. And all that was reinforced me by what happened after that, because the published report from the National Careers Council, which was loosely written and rather bland, included an appeal for what it called a culture change. But it didn't define with any clarity what that should involve. And the new minister, Matthew Hancock, who took over from John Hayes, issued what he called an inspiration vision statement, which contained no reference whatsoever to the roles of careers professionals or of careers programmes. Instead, it seems, all that was needed was for young people to have contact with employers and people in jobs. That's all they need. We don't need these career specials and career programs. So the whole of all this work had now been written out of the policy script, which was a direct betrayal of the last of the government's earlier promises, which was to build a strong career profession. And Hancock talked about this as representing a big culture change. He used that term, culture change invoking the National Careers Council's terminology. Now, one would have expected the Council at least to point out that the Minister's interpretation was not its own. That was not what it had meant at all. But it didn't. It, in its second report, which is better, came out this September, it did reaffirm the role of careers professionals, but it never juxtaposed that to what the government had done. It just simply stated it didn't make any comments about the fact that the government's gone in a completely different direction. And I think its main interest seems to have been self-promotion. And I think, therefore, it is culpable of having colluded not only with the massive erosion of careers provision for young people, but also with the mindless marginalisation of the careers profession. Now, it did include some stronger recommendations, and it may be, you know, if, if the government acts on those, then... Its argument, which was you've got to work on the inside and you mustn't criticise in public, can be claimed to have achieved something. But I would be amazed if that happened. And if not, I think that that issue is, that um, point I've made about collusion is really important. And what's remarkable is its position has contrasted so remarkably with the, what's happened with the Select Committee, which is this cross-party group of politicians who have continued to... Uh, to address these issues with great clarity, integrity, and tenacity. And that included an interview last December with Michael Gove, who was then the Secretary of State for Education. Now, we knew that the political narrative underlying the government's careers policies um, was that John Hayes's good intentions required support not only from, um, from uh, Biz which has largely done what it said, actually. The National Careers Council, Careers Service is still there. It's largely done what it promised to do. But it also required, it required support from DfE, where he had clearly been blocked by Michael Gove. And we knew that. But Michael Gove had never spoken publicly on the issue and had always resisted our efforts to have meetings with him. He always said, no, it's not my, no, it's, it's you know, Hayes or Hancock. But now he did say something, and it was quite extraordinary. He said quite clearly that more should be done to engage employers with schools, but then he said 
explicitly and unequivocally, what I emphatically do not believe is that we need a cadre of careers advisors to operate in between the two. Clear and unequivocal. Then his arguments are very interesting. He set up an idealised view of the careers advisor. He said what they need is perfect knowledge of the labour market, perfect knowledge of the psychology of motivation of the individuals. And then he said, because they can't be those supermen and superwomen, they shouldn't be made available at all. <laughs> now, what kind of logic is that? On that basis, actually, we would hardly engage in any human endeavours at all. <laughs> we might as well pack up. And then, and then, to add insult, serious insult to injury, he challenged the intellectual rigour, can you believe, and the self-interest of those who had populated the debate on this topic. He was asked who he named. Three times he was asked, you know, to name, and he refused. Now, intellectual rigour is based on evidence and reasoned argument. That's what it's based upon. Take apart those comments of go, and I challenge you to say anything in there which is based on evidence and any reasoned argument. There is nothing. For him, it's a stick put in that point about intellectual rigour was just disgraceful. Um, and, of course, in doing so, he rubbished all the work that we'd been doing for all those years, of which he patiently had not read a word. So he was prepared to make this accusation without having, you know, engaged with this at all. And he was the Secretary of State for Education. So it was disgraceful, it was arrogant, it was ignorant, but it did indicate very clearly the poverty of the intellectual foundations on which this government's careers policies, for young people in particular, have been based. That's what it did. And I think we should say it clearly and unequivocally. The policies pursued by this government have been, in this field have been among the most damaging I have seen in any country and pursued with an extraordinary mixture of incompetence, mendacity and casuistry. In all the debates on the statutory duty in the Education Act, it was assumed that what it was referring to was access to independent and impartial individual guidance from a careers professional. That was the basis on which everybody spoke, all the contributions made on that basis. Whereas in the latest statutory guidance, it seems that this wasn't the case at all. There must be something outside the school, but apparently the requirement to be impartial can be met simply through access to a number of partial providers. So if, as long as you have a few employers, you're OK, because you're impartial, aren't you? Really? I mean, it is unbelievable. As I've, I've read all this stuff, believe me, I really have read it word for word. And as you read it, you think, can they really be meaning that? Can they really be saying that? But they have. So, and that's pure casuistry. What is the point of a statutory duty placed on, based on that kind of definition? Now, of course, employers have important contributions to make, but they are complementary to and indeed largely dependent upon the roles of careers professionals and of careers programmes. The Careers Alliance, and Keith Hermans here has done great work with the Careers Alliance, produced a really very careful, diplomatically phrased, measured document, which argued that, which simply said, that's, this is what employers can do, this is what careers professionals and careers programmes can do. And it's been endorsed by many employers. Sadly, not the CBI and the National Careers Council, where they have made statements about this, but many, many employers, and they, they say, yes, of course, of course, we can't do it on our own. But why didn't they say so, so much more clearly to government? And why didn't the CBI say so much more clearly to government at the time? And there's been no response from the government. Now, we've got Nicky Morgan now taking over from Michael Gove. Will there be an act of repentance, as we saw with the Labour government? I... I, I'm not holding my breath. I'd be amazed if there's anything of any substance. Um, but we'll see. So what can we conclude from all of this? 
The story of these two false dawns, twice we were promised an all-age career service, both times it didn't happen. And I think we can interpret it in two ways. One is that there are examples of the government, the agenda being taken over by bigger agendas. So you have social exclusion and you have school autonomy. And that, that is part of the truth. But in both cases, the damage caused was greatly exacerbated by two powerful individuals, Anne Weinstock and Michael Gove, who displayed extraordinary ignorance and unwillingness to listen and learn and arrogance. So as so often in history, what happened was a mix of structural forces and of people. Now, there is one point in this which I want to just briefly say, which is, I think, part of the problem has been caused by our semantic confusion in this field. And I've been using the term career guidance during this, during this lecture. But the term is problematic because we use it in two ways. One is to cover everything. It's the generic term. And then sometimes I talk about, oh, no, no, it's the, the engagement with a career professional, which is career counselling, really. And we talk about those two ways. But I think that's confusing to many people. And I think, actually, what's happened has exploited that confusion. So I think we've got to do some work on that. I think maybe we should ban the use of the term career guidance for a bit and talk about <laughs> career development and then about career counselling. I think that would help a great de deal. But I think we, we've always had semantic problems in this field, and I think we have got to try and sort it out. And I think that's the big issue for the CDI. The other key conclusion I draw from this saga is the field must stand up for itself more strongly. There's been far too much collusion and not enough concerted affirmation. We must hold to our values and never be afraid of speaking truth to power. Anyway, enough of all that. I want to go back to some bigger issues now, but I wanted to say all that because I think it's quite important to do so. Um, in my more pessimistic moments, it feels that all we've built up on all over the last 50 years has now been wantonly destroyed. And actually, the poverty of the thinking underpinning, for example, the constant references. I mean, the number of times I've heard people talk about it, inspirational talks from employers, as some kind of panacea. And I think, my God, that's about, that was 50 years ago. We, we realised that, that, you know, the inadequacy of that. So sometimes I you know, do think that. But of course, of course, of course not all of it's been destroyed. Of course not. Much of what we built up is still here to provide a basis on which to build. So looking back, what have we achieved? Speaking personally, I identify five significant changes in which I've been involved along with many, many other people. The first I've already mentioned, which is the move to a focus on learning as the core concept in career development. And that includes addressing individuals' conceptual development in their understanding both of themselves and the opportunities available to them, and helping them to develop their competences for constructing their career which, of course, includes where and when to look for help. And it should incorporate active experiences. I do believe passionately in the importance of work experience, simulation, shadowing, all that stuff. Programmatic learning and supported reflection on all that learning to converse into actions that are well-informed but also well thought through. It's not just the information book. Second. We have developed a research culture and a research tradition based on a multidisciplinary approach. Psychology is always going to be the core discipline because at its heart, career development is about individuals. But because it's always about individuals in social contexts, it needs in addition to draw from labour market economics, from sociology, including socio-political perspectives, and also can draw fruitfully from other disciplines, philosophy, history, literature. And in my view, the tradition we have built up here in the UK is broader in those respects than in the States, certainly, and actually in most other countries. And I think we should be very proud of that and value it. Third, we have built a strong tradition of innovation Linked significantly, though not exclusively, to technology. Um, I was involved right at the beginning of my career. I went to the States and saw all the early attempts to use computers. And uh, I was involved in a number of the first major projects to do this in the, in, in the UK. And it's been amazing to see 
the transformation that has taken place as technology has advanced. Absolutely amazing. And managing that use of technology as an agent of change, not as a replacement, not simply as a tool, as an agent of change, and its interactive relationship to human interventions is going to remain a core challenge. Fourth, we've established, I think, a tradition of policy discourses and policy studies linked to a vision of lifelong career development. The core argument is that career development is not just a private good, it is a public good. It is a key lubricant of effective learning systems, of effective labour markets, and of social equity. Therefore, it requires public policies to deliver it and make it available and accessible to all lifelong. And the attention given in recent years to lifelong career development policies, strategies and systems by organisations like OECD, European Commission, UNESCO, ILO, World Bank is, I think, remarkable and a major advance. And that's linked to a further, I think, fifth significant change, which is the internationalisation of this field with many more opportunities for countries to learn from each other. And I think there is an imp a crucial important role for international studies based on strong analytical frameworks which enable the similarities and differences between countries to be identified. It's through those kinds of studies that countries can, can recognise <coughs> the contingent nature of practice they take for granted and explore possibilities for innovation and change. It's when you go somewhere else that you realise things can be done differently. And things which you've taken for granted, you something oh, well, wait a minute, it doesn't always have to be like that. Now, I've written quite a lot on most of these matters, and my, my, I have written rather a lot, I've been rather verbose. Um, my reason for writing is, is, is actually very simple. Um, I actually, I don't know what I think before I write it. You know, you can get away with lots of things in conversations, and you can try this and try that, and, you know, be a bit woolly. But when you've got to sit down and write it out, you've got to say, what do I really think? and um, weigh up the arguments and the evidence and decide what it means and you know, where one stands. It's, it's actually, I've, I've always found it hard work, um, but I think it's really important work. And, I really, and also, if you then publish it, it adds to this body of collective knowledge on which we can all benefit and all learn. So I really do commend it to you. I know for busy practitioners it's another thing to do, but some people do it, and when they do, they make fantastic contributions. And the more that this profession can do that kind of work, the stronger it will become. A lot of my writing has been in collaboration with other people. Um, and the test of collaboration is whether, when you finish writing it, you think, actually, I could have done that better myself. And that's what has occasionally crossed my mind, I have to confess, not, not very often. But most of the time, you think, oh, no, 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 actually, I could never have done that on my own. It's by working with somebody else we produce something better than either of us could have produced on our own. And I have been enormously fortunate in my collaborators, the many people I have worked with, Bill Law, Jim Sampson, Ronald Zoltana, Ian Jameson, Andy Miller, Richard Sweet, Tristram as well, and other colleagues in ISEX. And I have learned so much from them. And I do think what we have produced was, in many cases, far, far better than I could ever have done. The other thing which I've given quite a lot of time to, um, along again with many, many other people, is building infrastructures within this field which can harness energies and support communities of practice. Because that is, it's, it's by developing communities of practice that we all get energy and, you know, and sort of stimulation from each other. So CRAC, NYSEC, Guidance Council, ISEGS, uh, the International Centre for Career Development Public Policy, the European Lifelong Guidance Policy Network, the Careers Alliance, all of these, I think, have played important roles. And we've now got histories of a number of them. We've got the history of ISEGS, which has been published now. Has is, is is everybody got that? Or? It's, it's available. It's available. It's, available. it's, it's actually it's really rather good. It's, it's, it's got lots of pictures, too. Um, but it's, it's a really interesting story. So there's, quite, there's been quite a lot of written about all of these. Um, but what's interesting about a number of things I've been involved in is that many of them have been actually hybrids between formal organizational structures and networks. It's a mix of the two. 
And I th I've always thought, actually, if you get that mix right, you're probably going to be in the best position because you need the kind of sustainability which you get from organisations, but also the flexibility and creativity you get through networks. And if you can get those working together, and many of these I have actually been hybrids in one form or another. Um, and all of them independent on small groups of people, often two or three to start with and then bring other people in, having a conversation, having another conversation, saying who should we talk to, da 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 da, da to make something happen. And it's based on people getting energy from each other to do it. So I've been enormously fortunate to work with many, many dedicated and creative people in these and many other projects, and quite a number of people in this room. And I thank you all for that. As I close this 50 years, I do feel very, very optimistic about the future. We have very strong foundations on which to build. Internationally, we have IEBG, along with the International Centre and this tradition of International Policy Symposia. In Europe, and I am a very passionate European, I can't believe that we don't realise how important being part of Europe is. I was, born, I, 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 was, um, I was born in 1942, and we lived in Portsmouth, and we were bombed out. And my mother told this story about pushing this pram with me and all our worldly possessions down this street in 1942. We loved us. We always said, tell us the story. You know. And then we went to Germany just after the war, when we, I saw everything, you know, completely destroyed. Because we were one of the first English families that went out. And my first school was, uh, I was one of two English children in a German kindergarten in 1946. Interesting. And then I went, I remember going to a, a, a conference and there were, Eight of us went out for dinner, all from different countries, Germany, France, da, 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 and we had this fantastic dinner, we had this fantastic conversation, and I thought, wow, here we all are as Europeans working together, learning from each other. We fought each other for centuries, and now we're learning to work together and learn from each other. Under. And that's the vision. That's why it's so important. So I am passionate about Europe. Um, and, you know, we've got lots of stuff in Europe as well. We've got, actually, we've got three networks. We've got ELGPL on policy, we've got the NICE network on training and research, and we've got Euroguidance on practice. Now, all this has got to continue to evolve, but we, internationally we have a lot of stuff there. And then in the UK, we now have the basis of a world-class quality assurance system. We've got Matrix, we've got uh, the organisational standards, uh, nationally validated through the policy and career standard, which is a great achievement which incentivized the government's ignoring the quality and career standards in the statutory guidance is disgraceful, not even to refer to it. And this, we've had this recent ISAC study, which has demonstrated, we did a comparative analysis, very important report, by the way, get the Sutton Trust report, Tristram led it, and we've demonstrated the schools which have met the quality and career standards do significantly better than schools that don't in relation to a whole series of things about school attendance and achievements and so forth. So, but it was ignored. Anyway, um, but we do have that. We have the quality and career standards. And then we have the professional standards being developed by the CDI representing the profession as a whole and Claire told us about all the, the, the great things that are happening with the CDI. And I do think the CDI is one of the, one of the great developments over the last few years in this country, in this field. Um, the previous splintering of the field was a significant source of weakness. All the organisations have come together and people have had to give up quite a lot, but they've done it and there's fantastic energy and I really admire what's, what's being done. So I do urge all of you to join the CDI and to help to make it a success, which it already is, but a, to even, an even greater success. Um, in particular, I hope that those of you who are members of AGCAS, which is the one organisation which has stayed outside the fold, to resolve its relationship with the CDI. I've heard... See, AGCAS was part of the division discussions and then withdrew. I've heard the arguments. I'm unconvinced by any of them, actually. Either AGCAS is a professional association, in which case it should join CDI. 
or it's not, in which case it should actively urge its members to, to join CDI. If ever there was a time for the profession to come together and affirm its professionalism, this is it. And I think, this is the last kind of slightly barbed thing I'm going to say, but I think for a relatively privileged group, like those in universities, to stand outside this process is, in my view, indefensible. <coughs> a related development which has particularly delighted me is the evolution of NISEC, from a research and development organisation into a learned society, Unique in the world, I think, actually in that respect, and quite a number of people here involved as NISEC fellows. And also the partnership with NISEC, which NISEC has now forged with the CDI, through which the excellent <coughs> NISEC journal is now distributed to all CDI members. I think that is fantastic for NISEC and for CDI. It boosts the professionalism of the profession. To have a learned journal is the basis for it. And, of course, it means that that relationship between... Practice and theory and research is greatly, greatly strengthened. So I think that's been a fantastic development. And then I'm also absolutely thrilled by the way in which ISEX has developed over the last few years. Deirdre Hughes did a great job in building up the centre, but when she left, there was a hiatus, and the university could easily have dismantled it. To its great credit, it didn't do so, since Tristram's come back into the room. <laughs> well timed. I think under Tristram, it has moved to a new level, both intellectually and in the range and quality of its work. Um, I've recently been working with an international consultancy company which has been reviewing all career, de career development uh, service providers globally. And it described, I said, well, once this meeting, it described, I said, and I love the language of these kinds of companies, it said, Ah, I think, yes, that's a best-in-class, best-in-class organisation globally, globally. Now, they've just done this quite independently, you know, but that's what they've come up with. And I think it is, actually. In world terms, this is a leading research centre. The university's motivation for setting up the centre was that as a teaching-led university, it should concentrate its research activities in niches linked to its values. That was the simple rationale, which included very significantly extending access. That was one of the core values for this institution. And it was linked with that the decision was made to set up ISEX. And I think the university should be very proud of the commitment it made, the way in which it sustained that commitment, and what the centre has achieved, and will continue to achieve. Because that's the other thing. I mean, I've, I've been very privileged to work in a field populated by so many good people, dedicated to, to helping others through their work. And I feel, one of the reasons why I feel very happy about retiring is that I feel there are so many good people who can continue all this work. And you don't need me any longer. I think I've done my bit. But there are lots of people around, and I think ISEX is a really, really important part of it. It's why I'm, I'm finding this thing so easy, actually. I'm very, very happy about it. Um, and I really feel that the field is in good hands. There's so many good people, there are good structures. And, I mean, despite my, I've made one or two slightly astringent comments, because I do have strong views on some of these matters. Um, but, in general, in general, I have enormously enjoyed my work. I've worked with some fantastic people. We shared so much in terms of values and so on. And I've made so many great friends through it. So, as that rather wonderful actor, John LeMessurier, said in his last words, it's all been rather lovely. <laughs> <laughs>